Good morning. Really good to have you with us here on Ammonford Evangelical Church's online Sunday service. I wonder where you're listening to us from today, maybe far away up the valley in Brunaman, or maybe even further than that. We, I know we have some people sometimes listening from Zambia, from Uganda, from all sorts of different corners of the world. Well, a real warm welcome to you this morning. Maybe you could drop a message to us later on. If you haven't said hello already, come and say hello. Tell us where you're from. Introduce yourself a little bit. It'd be great to get to know you, even if you are in uh, New Zealand or as far as you can get from Ammonford. Uh, we're glad to have you with us this morning. Did you know that you being with us, you being interested in Jesus, being far away, even just us here being in the UK, that we're a fulfillment of what Jesus promised right at the beginning of the story of Acts. Over the last couple of months, we've been looking at this. The beginning, the origin story of the church in the book of Acts in the Bible. And right at the start, chapter one, verse eight, Jesus says to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's the story we see unfolding. The disciples telling people in Jerusalem about Jesus and then Judea and last week Samaria. And this week we're going to meet somebody from the ends of the earth. And that's who we are here in Britain. We're not natives of Jerusalem. Uh, wherever you are sitting right now, I bet you don't come from Jerusalem. Maybe a couple of you do. That would be fun. But we're from the ends of the earth. We're the people who are the fulfillment of what Jesus promised, that his good news, the good news of his death and resurrection, of forgiveness, of life, is going to go to the end of the earth. And we're part of that this morning. But before we sing, I just wanted to read one other passage, because I wonder if when we gather together on a Sunday morning, when we switch on the online service, if sometimes we perhaps often don't really feel like we belong here, like what we've done this week should keep us from prayer. What we've said this week should keep us from singing and saying stuff about Jesus. We often feel like sin keeps us from God, disqualifies us from coming close to him. But let me read you these verses from Isaiah 53. We'll hear them later on in the sermon too. Isaiah writes, looking forward to Jesus, says, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. See, that's the good news for us today is, well, we don't belong here. We shouldn't be able to pray. We really shouldn't be allowed in God's presence, but because of Jesus, because our punishment all of our sorrows, all our griefs and darkness fell on him. At the cross, we can come close. We've been washed clean. We've been made ready. We've been qualified to come into Jesus' presence. So let's do that today. As we sing, as we pray, as we listen to Sammy open up God's word to us later on, let's do it with confidence, knowing that Jesus is the one who's made it possible for people from every tribe and tongue and nation, every corner of the world, whatever we've done, whoever you are, whoever you've been in the past, Jesus makes it possible for us all to gather together to worship him with clean hearts, with clean hands, to worship him today. So let's do that and sing together.
I want you to imagine this morning that in front of you are two doors and you have the choice which door you're going to go through. But before you make that decision, someone tells you that the door on the right is a door through which you will find joy, that you will find happiness, gladness, rejoicing, not just for you, but for everyone who's around you, everyone who's close to you, everyone who learns about you and what you find beyond that door. It doesn't take much brains, does it, to say that that is the door that you should choose, regardless of whether you know what's behind the other door and all the nitty gritty details of what's through that door. If somebody tells you that the choice is between no joy and just joy abounding, all of us would choose to go and to follow joy, wouldn't we? Now keep that idea in your mind as we think about as we explore the second half of Acts chapter 8. We're carrying on in the book of Acts the story of the birth and the growth and the life of the early church, of the good news about Jesus, which sprung forth in that garden, the good news that appeared to one and two and three and four and multiplied and overflowed in the lives of so many. We're carrying on and we're picking up today in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up, go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So Philip got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He was in charge of her entire treasury. Now this official had come to worship in Jerusalem and now was sitting in his chariot on the way home, reading the prophet Isaiah out loud. The spirit told Philip, go, join that chariot. So Philip ran up beside it and he heard the reading of the prophet Isaiah. And so he shouted out, do you understand what it is that you're reading? How can I? answered the official, unless someone teaches me unless someone guides me and explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. Now this was the passage of scripture that the official was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb is silent before its shearer so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied to him. Who will describe his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, who is this prophet speaking about? Is he speaking about himself or is he speaking about someone else? Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that very scripture. Now, as they were traveling down the road, they came across some water and the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized right here right now. So he ordered the chariot to stop and both he and Philip made their way down into the water and there he was baptized. When they came up out of the water the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch did not see him any longer but went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in Azotus and he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. It's a great story. It's a favourite of many. It's a favourite, certainly, of John Perry's. Uh, He said that in the week that he was jealous that I was the one who got to preach this. But it's a story that shows us a few things. I think as we um, zoom in on some of the characters, we'll get lessons for us, real, strong, practical lessons for us here today, in whatever sort of place that we might find ourselves in, spiritually speaking. And the first character I think we should zoom in is on Philip himself, and how Philip is someone who is prepared. Philip is someone who is prepared. Just imagine what Philip's life is like at this point. He's someone who has responded to the good news about Jesus. He is someone who clearly is passionate about sharing Jesus, teaching about Jesus, about inviting others in. And he's someone who's been 
asked in the early church to go ahead and wait on tables. He's someone who in chapter 6 was spotted to be full of faith and full of wisdom and full of the Spirit and asked to be part of making sure that in the church there was no one who was in need. To make sure that the, the resources that the church had put in together turned into material, real help for the widows and others who needed it. But one of the folks that he was serving alongside shoulder to shoulder was murdered, was stoned to death for their faith and their fidelity to the good news about Jesus. And Philip, along with many others, were scattered out of Jerusalem. He went to Samaria, to a sketchy sort of neighbouring uh, zone, where they're like awkward cousins or, or half-brothers to the Jews. And while he's there, that passion that's inside him to share Jesus and to speak Jesus continues. And actually, some amazing things happen. People are healed. Demons are cast out. Folks come to faith and request baptism in Jesus' name. Even this sorcerer named Simon, who has held um, sway over so many in that region, he wants to be a part of what's going on. And it's this whole thing, it's this whole commotion. So having been asked to serve in a particular way, but only having been able to do that for a short time, then being scattered up to Samaria and being involved in some remarkable things there, now he is sent by God south. South along a road that doesn't really lead anywhere, a road that he's not expecting probably to meet any people on, a road that's described as being a wild wilderness, a desolate desert place. Just think how chaotic his life is. And yet in all of that, he is someone who is prepared, or we might say willing, to say yes to what God has in store for him. In Acts chapter 6, he's willing to say yes to this opportunity to manifest, to make real the good news about Jesus, to make sure that the church is a place where no one is in need. That just like Jesus, there are folks who are giving themselves, emptying themselves so that those who are empty might be filled up. He's willing, he's prepared to say yes in the first part of chapter 8, to head into this sketchy region of Samaria and not just keep his head down, as persecution breaks out, but to lift his head up and prepare to speak about Jesus and represent Jesus in this new frontier place. He's willing, he's prepared, at the prompting of God, the voice of this angel of the Lord speaking to him, to head south with no idea about what he is going to encounter. And when he's on that road and a chariot appears, he's willing once more when God prompts, when God speaks, to run up alongside. Again, not knowing what might happen. Philip is someone who is prepared, who is willing at all turns and at all opportunities to say yes to God. But more than just being prepared in that sense to say yes, he is someone who's prepared in another sense. He is someone who is prepared when he hears Isaiah being read to strike up a conversation about it, to put himself out there. He has been preparing himself for moments like this almost his whole life. He's been preparing so that when opportunities to speak Jesus arise, he is able to take it. He's prepared in the sense that Peter would often encourage disciples to be prepared. Always be prepared, Peter wrote, to give an answer for the hope that you have. He's willing and he's equipped to speak up. Now, willingness is about the inclination of our heart. Willingness is is wanting, is desiring to say yes when God calls. Peter has, um, Philip has that in spades. But he's also prepared. Being prepared is another thing. Being prepared means that he is able to take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves. 
And I wonder whether we as believers here today are prepared in those set both of those senses. Do we have the desire? Do we have that inclination to say yes to God when we hear his voice, when the spirit prompts, when opportunities arise, when the scriptures direct? Are we willing to say yes? More than that, are we able to say yes? Are we able to run up alongside a chariot to hear Isaiah being read and say, I can help you explain that. I can fill in the blanks. I can tell you about Jesus starting even in the very place that you are reading at the moment. Are we equipped in that sense? Have we been making it so that we can say yes? And I'm not just thinking about sharing the good news, about speaking out the gospel. I just mean... Do we have our lives organised in such a way that we are able to respond? You know, one of the things when Jones used to speak about a lot of the time, which I loved, was building margin into our lives. And I worry sometimes that as Christians, we can't say yes, even when our hearts want to say yes, because we haven't been building in margin. There is a, um, a shift in our culture. Um, from cards and cash to using um, watches and telephones to pay for things. And one of the things that I've noticed is that it means that it's, it's difficult to be generous towards strangers when my only way of ha- spending money, of giving money, is through a contactless payment. We had it... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we went out for dinner in a restaurant and I'd gone and I thought, well, I'm going to be able to pay on my phone. So I didn't take a card. I didn't take any cash. But it got to the end of the meal and it was obvious that I couldn't put a tip onto the card machine. And it was it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing that I did not have the means to be generous. You know, I should have been preparing myself. I should have been thinking about, well, if I'm in this opportunity, how will I be generous? How will I be kind? How will I show grace? Perhaps it is not like that, but it's it's with us as Christians. We've got absolutely smashed schedules, just things jammed in left, right and centre. And it's catastrophic in terms of our ability to respond and say say yes to opportunities that arise. That we've already filled our time, filled our life with so much stuff that we can't say yes when God prompts. Maybe it's thinking more about building margin in terms of, 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 of how comfortable we are with our faith and our knowledge of the things of God, of the good news of Jesus. We're comfortable coming week in, week out and having our conscience soothed by this good news that we're forgiven. That it doesn't matter what we've done, that we can still have hope and life in Jesus. And yet we don't have any desire or drive to be able to explain that faith, to help that faith manifest in other people's lives. We don't ever really want to grow up in Jesus, know Jesus more, so that we might offer the object of our faith to those around us. Our hearts need to be prepared. We need to be willing, but so does the rest of us. We need to to manufacture the space in our lives and tool ourselves and equip ourselves to be able to say yes when God calls us. How do we do that? Well that willingness in our heart, that that sort of a thing that we can't fake, can we? We can't manufacture that desire to respond to God, that desire to say yes to Jesus as he said yes to coming and living and dying for us. But I tell you what does foster a willingness in our heart is deliberately pursuing thankfulness in our lives. I wonder how often we deliberately set time and space and energy and attention to articulate what it is that we're thankful for from God in our lives. You know, as evangelical Christians, we would never doubt, we would never um, dare not say thank you for the gospel 
the good news, God, that, that we can live forever in relationship with you because Jesus came and lived and died and rose again, that we can be forgiven, that we're washed clean and all of this. Of course, we'd say thank you for that. But do we cultivate an attitude just in general of gratefulness, of thankfulness, of thanksgiving to God for his special grace in Jesus and his general grace in our lives? Do you know, I think, although we cannot manufacture that willingness, that preparedness in our hearts to say yes, I think that if we learn to be more grateful people, more thankful people, spotting God at work in our lives, in the, uh, in the lives of those around us, that we will be more willing to respond. Because our as our hearts are filled with thanksgiving, we'll want to say more and more yes to the God who has saved us. But not just that preparedness, that willingness, that ableness. How can we how can we make it so that we're more able to say yes? And, and to respond appropriately in the opportunities that God gives us. Well, don't just wait to be told the truth about Jesus. Go and investigate. Go and learn. Take the initiative to be people who want to know the Bible better, who want to know Jesus more for ourselves, who want to explore every nook and cranny and crevice of who he is and what he has done and the impact that it has in our lives. Be sort of self-teachers. Be people who are hungry to know more. In the new year, one of the things that I'm hoping we're going to do in the church is, is have a little monthly meeting where we are um, wrestling with like the chronology of the Bible, of putting the Bible together, the different characters, the different stories, the different places, and understanding how they fall in line, how they um, sort of arrange themselves in the history of salvation. One of the things that I've really benefited from so far this term as we've been looking at Ezra and as we're about to look at Nehemiah it is really kind of in my mind figuring out where that fits in the flow of the whole sweep of scripture and what other books in scripture Haggai and Zechariah and, and Malachi and others like Esther how they fit alongside that has really benefited me it's helped me to to learn from these books about Jesus, it's equipped me, it's, it's tooled me, it's given me the resources I think I need to explain and to be thankful for Jesus more and more. Perhaps in the new year, that's something that you'd want to do. Come alongside and, and, and be a part of that monthly meeting, working our way through the Bible so that we're more comfortable with the Bible. I mentioned rooted groups there. I mean, if you're not a part of a rooted group, then, then why not? Why not use that thing that we have in the life of the church, not just Sunday mornings listening to sermons, but coming together and asking questions and being asked questions, helping us explore and finding answers in Jesus together. If you want to be a part of a rooted group, just get in touch. We're desperate to have more people involved. We're desperate to start more groups so that more people can be involved. You Maybe you already are, and you're going, and it's just routine. No, recognize that these are genuine opportunities for you, week in, week out, to prepare. Prepare yourself for life that is ahead of you, for all the highs and the lows that you're going to encounter, but to prepare yourself to be able to say yes to God when he puts opportunities in your way. And another suggestion on how we might prepare ourselves is, is to practice. To practice speaking Jesus, not to, to strangers, not to potentially hostile individuals and environments, but to a receptive audience. You know, I think that one of the things that we do not do enough as Christians is to speak Jesus with one another. We wonder why we can't speak Jesus to strangers confidently, effectively, like Philip does here. And I think one of the reasons is because we don't speak Jesus enough to ourselves and to one another. So thankfulness, fostering thankfulness and gratitude will help us, I think, to be more willing. But we just need to take the opportunities that God has given us already to sort of like up 
skill ourselves up, inform ourselves, to practice, to dive deeper, to know Jesus more. There are so many opportunities and perhaps one of the first things we need to do is say yes to God and take those opportunities to learn before we anticipate other opportunities in our lives. Philip was someone who had spent his life, in a sense, preparing to to say yes to God in these situations. But it's not just Philip. That was one of the characters we were going to encounter. The second character is this Ethiopian. And I think the Ethiopian is for us someone who is parched, who is thirsty, who is wanting and desiring something in God. Did you read it or did you hear it when I read it? This man, the official, had gone up to Jerusalem to worship, but now he was on his way home. He was sitting in his chariot and he's reading the book of the prophet Isaiah. He'd gone up and now he's heading home. You know, my best guess is that he'd gone up and he hadn't received, he hadn't found what he wanted for. He hadn't got much of a welcome when he went to Jerusalem to worship. Why am I coming to that conclusion? Well, for a starter, because he's a foreigner. And we know from the whole context of the New Testament that those who were in control in the temple weren't exactly favourable. They weren't exactly keen to welcome foreigners in. They had a separate court for people like him who looked different, who sounded different, to keep them, at you, if you like, at an arm's length. But more than that, it, it mentions here that he was a eunuch. Someone who had been castrated, it was a common thing, a common-ish thing in this period of history that to be a court official, to have these sort of important jobs, to be close to royalty, to serve in certain ways that you needed to have been castrated. Who knows? It's totally alien to us, I get. But actually it was another thing that would have counted him out, would have put him even more at arm's length when he came to the temple. Because those who had been um, sort of affected in that way, shall we put it, were also supposed to be cut off and kept away. So my best guess, the best guess of the commentators is that this guy who is parched, who is thirsty, who is hungry, who is searching for something, has gone up but is now coming away empty-handed. And there's a sadness in that, isn't there? And yet he's not put off. Perhaps this is a scroll that he's taken with him in anticipation of filling his time studying God's word on the long journey there and the long journey back. Perhaps when he was there, this was the the best thing that he could come up with, buying this scroll of the prophet Isaiah and that he was desperate to take it away and to learn. Whatever he's experienced when he's been in Jerusalem, now on, on his way back, he's not given up. He's not being put off. He's still desperate. He still desires to know more. When Philip hears him speaking out loud the words of the prophet, and when Philip asks him, do you understand that is what that you're reading? He still desires enough to invite Philip up alongside him and to ask him to explain these scriptures to him. Do you know, in the works of Luke, Luke's gospel, in Acts, we've encountered so many people who are interested in Jesus, but only in like a a lukewarm sort of way. Back in the gospel of Luke, there were so many people who had questions, who had an interest, but not because they desired, but not because they were thirsty, not because they wanted anything from Jesus but because they wanted to pass judgment on Jesus or because they were bored or or just because it was the flavour of the day. But this guy, this guy really wants, doesn't he? He really is parched. He really is looking to have that thirst quenched. And much like us who believe, who are being prepared to respond, this thirsty work is the Spirit's work in his life. I can't tell you how to manufacture that as well if you're interested just a little bit. To have this real thirst is the work of God in your life. 
But I will say this, if you are a parched individual, if you are a thirsty person, if you are someone who is searching for more, well then what should you do? You should keep on searching. He's gone up to worship. I think he's probably been rejected. He's been disappointed in what he's found. And yet he keeps on searching, isn't he? There are so many things that could put us off really drilling down, seeking, looking into Jesus. Not least of all, the church, God's people. Sometimes we don't do a very good job of presenting him, of representing him. Sometimes we'll be the very ones who are putting up the no entry sign to to folks like him who are different, different race, ethnicity, language, speech, sexuality, all of these sorts of things. It's the church who puts the no entry sign, keeps you at an arm's length. Please, please, please do not be put off from Jesus by disappointments in that, those sorts of areas. Keep searching. Remain humble in your search. I love the fact that this proud, potentially, important official, he's got a high status, he's in charge of the entire treasury of an entire nation. He's not willing, he's not unwilling to admit that he doesn't know what what the scriptures are about. The stranger running alongside this, I don't know what Philip would have appeared to him just running alongside his chariot. Oi, do you know what you're reading about? Imagine the humility for him to say, do you know what? No, I don't. No, I don't. And I want to know more. It's hard for us sometimes to admit that that we don't know. It's hard to us to admit sometimes out loud to others, let alone to ourselves, that we're desperate, that we're parched, that we're thirsty, that we're hungry, that we want to know. So remain humble and ask questions. Asking questions is not a sign of ignorance, of of stupidity, of 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 a of a, of, a, of a lack really. Asking questions are the first steps everyone has to take in finding answers. So if you are a parched individual, well then keep on searching. Don't be put off. Remain humble. Um, Open yourself up to the possibility that others may be the ones who inform you and bring you into knowledge and understanding and light. And keep asking questions. The wonderful thing in this story is that Philip prepared, is able to fill in the gaps for this official, this Ethiopian who is parched. Beginning with this very scripture, he's able to articulate and explain the good news about Jesus. Now Isaiah 53, which is where he is reading, has become one of the most important chapters in the Old Testament for believers in Jesus. It's a chapter which now the knowledge of Jesus and what he has done seems so obvious that speaks about an innocent one coming, an innocent one serving to the point of death so that others might find life. One who is cut off and whose life is cut short, having a family, descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the earth. Philip starts with that scripture fills in the blanks, explains to this thirsty, wanting, desiring official. And what is the result? He wants to be baptised. It's quite reminiscent, I guess, of what Peter did the first couple of times we read sermons in the book of Acts. He stood up and he explained to everyone who wanted to know that Jesus had come that Jesus had lived, that Jesus had died, but that Jesus had risen to life again. And the appropriate response was to repent, was to turn around from our selfishness and our sinfulness, to throw ourselves on the mercy and the grace and the love of God in Christ, and to respond by being baptized, to receive the Holy Spirit and to enter into God's family, not to stay at arm's length, but to be welcomed in as brothers and sisters and citizens in his kingdom. 
And Philip fills in the gap and he explains all of this. And as far as we can tell, this, this official, this Ethiopian eunuch responds. He says, well, yes, there's water here. Why wouldn't I be baptized? Why wouldn't I say yes to that? And so they stop and they go into the water and they're baptized. And this wonderful, miraculous things happen where Philip is snatched away. He is transported by the spirit somewhere else. The eunuch, the official is left without the evangelist, but with the evangel. Philip isn't there anymore, but he has received Jesus. Despite from being far off, this good news to him has landed and it finishes up with joy with rejoicing. Specifically here, it speaks about the eunuch rejoicing. His thirst has at last been quenched. But again, if we were to hazard our guess, it wasn't just he that was rejoicing, but Philip would have gone off rejoicing as well. If anybody's ever been involved in someone coming to to know Jesus, to have faith in Jesus, then you will know the joy that it brings you. And Jesus as well promised that when one guilty person turns and finds forgiveness in him, there is rejoicing in heaven. There's rejoicing for the Ethiopian. There's rejoicing, no doubt, for Philip. There's rejoicing when promised by Jesus in heaven. There's joy, joy, joy. Happiness, rejoicing, thanksgiving all over the shop. Remember those doors that I mentioned at the start. If someone offered you to go through one of two doors and one was filled with joy and rejoicing and thanksgiving, surely you'd go through it. Well, well, here's the door for us today, the choice for us. Do we want to be people like Philip who are prepared? If we want to know joy, if we want to experience rejoicing and thanksgiving, then we will be a prepared people. Do we want to be uh, people filled with joy, those who are parched, those who are thirsty? Well, then be like this Ethiopian who keeps on asking, who keeps on searching and is relentless. But when he finds the answer, he grasps it with both hands. Who would be unwilling who would not want to go through that door, I ask you? So this morning, this story, it leads us in that direction, doesn't it? That if we want joy, if we want rejoicing, then we will be prepared. And we like, perhaps, for you this morning, to be like that Ethiopian who keeps on searching until satisfaction is found. Because the good news is that wherever Jesus is, when we search out Jesus, when we offer Jesus, when Jesus is responded to, there will always be joy. I pray that we would be a people who are seeking joy in these ways in the coming days. Lord God, be with us. We see your spirit at work in these stories. We want your spirit at work in our lives too that heart that desires to know and to say yes to you, Lord, that is a work of the Spirit. Give us that, we pray. That heart that desires to know Jesus in the first place, that thirst, that hunger, that parchedness, that is a work of your Spirit. We pray for that in the lives of so many too. Lord, we know that where Jesus is, there is rejoicing. And so we pray that you would lead us all towards Jesus in his great and his glorious name. Amen. Gladness.
From you, O God, come beautiful promises. From your mouth, words which give hope and joy. When fear and doubt would cloud our hearts, your promises bring light and life. Where else would we go to know our futures? Where else could we go to find rest and peace? With you there is grace. With you there is mercy. With you there is life abundant. You have promised that those who cling to you will receive an inheritance of belonging. You have promised that those who run to you will receive an inheritance of a home. You have promised that those who follow you will receive an invite into your presence. Be merciful towards us, Lord. Forgive us our sin. Lend your ear to our pleas for restoration as we seek you and the keeping of your promises. Christ has come, of that we are certain, and Christ will come again. Our hope as certain as the death he died, our hope as certain as the resurrection he has begun, our hope as certain as the glory of your name. Your will be done, your word kept, in our lives as it is in heaven. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this week, getting toward the end of our service. So time to say thank you. Um, thank you to you for joining us. Thank you to Sammy for putting on uh, everything together for this week's service. Just a couple of dates to give you a bit of advance notice of. If you're a part of our church, if you're a member especially, then we've got a members meeting on the 9th of November. That's a Wednesday night. Um, 
just after half term, so 9th of November, we're going to be meeting in our church building in Amonford, in Athlisel, in the Lantern. I hope to see you there if you're a church member with us. If you'd like to put anything on the agenda for that, anything you want to talk about uh, during that meeting or beforehand, um, just let us know. Send us an email in the office. Grab me and Sammy during the week if you can. Uh, but members meeting, 9th of November, Wednesday, down in Thyssel in Ammonford. And just before that, the Sunday before, the 6th of November, a couple of things to do with food um, to let you know about. We'll be eating after the meeting. So if you come on down to our physical church gathering, half past 10 in Llandebeer, in Llandebeer Memorial Hall, um, you can stick around and we'll have a big lunch all together. Um, free, don't need to bring anything unless you would like to. Um, just come along and enjoy a bit of uh, fellowship and food afterwards, 6th of November. And then that evening, we'll have our youth meeting. So um, I'll let you know the venue a bit closer to the time, but anybody who's in secondary school can come along and we'll have pizza and share some Bible studies together. So if you know somebody who's got secondary school or that's you yourself, you'll be invited to that as well, November the 6th in the evening. But as we go, let's um, finish where we started. Acts chapter 1. Remember, Jesus sent out his disciples and said, when the Holy Spirit comes and gives you power, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, at home where you live, in Samaria and Judea, the lands around, and to the ends of the earth. That's where Jesus sends us today. We've gathered together to watch the service, to be with him and worship him. And now he sends us out to go and be his witnesses, to gossip the gospel, to share the good news wherever we are, and so as we go, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what's pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.